the right thing over there. Okay, so um, I guess you guys can do your intro and we could do ours after that. You, you all usually as a decent at the same time. Yeah, at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Cool guys, how does that look? Can you guys see that? Yeah, I can see it. It looks good. Nice. Yeah. I'll be here now. We are live on Twitch just with the intro video at the moment. There's no sound at the moment. Hey everybody, welcome to Solidity Fridays, where a bunch of people who say they're Solidity devs look at Solidity code and try and figure it out. This week we're joined by our special and absolutely fantabulous guest, Float Capital, and we'll be looking through their code with their help. Uh, I am William Schwab, I'm joined by Ben Sparks, we're Solidity Development Labs, and we're joined by Jordan and John John from Float Capital. Um, ben, did you, did you want to kick things off? Sure. Um, yeah. So, so just ahead of time, I'm sorry if my stuff cuts out, guys. Uh, connection's a bit shaky. Some of Linum is still in Mauritius. Uh, so we'll do what we can. Um, That's yeah, like a total and, flux, by the way. Like, you know, like <laughs> it's bad because I am a victim. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's, it's been fantastic. We just did a, a company offsite. Um, anyway, about Solidity. Uh, let, let's, uh, Will and I were thinking we could structure this with sort of two sides. Um, we've got some sort of financial and economic questions about the protocol, and then some more technical solidity focused questions about the protocol. Uh, so, so we might start off with the financial stuff and just get more of an overview from you guys, and then dive deeper into the technicals, if that's okay with you. Yeah, Paula, thanks so much for the intro there, Will and Bear. Absolutely great to be here. Myself, John John here, one of the Solidity engineers, and also Jason. How's it, guys? Um, I am joining through John John's microphone, so don't get confused. I hope our voices are different enough to distinguish, distinguish between us. Um, so, yeah, we also are um, not in our normal places. We are in Plettenberg Bay at the moment, also doing our company offsite, which is really exciting. Uh, so we've got a beautiful view in front of us, and we are super excited to go through our code with you guys. And I hope you've got some juicy questions for us, because those are our favorite. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, let's let's maybe can you guys give us just the basic overview for someone who's, who's maybe a bit familiar with DeFi, doesn't understand the finance and the economics too deeply, but has played around maybe with Uniswap or Compound um, and, or Synthetics, and just tell us what Float Capital is about. What does it do? 
maybe before you do that, if I can just stick in one thing, if it's possible to make the text bigger on in the text editor, just like control plus sign that a couple of times. How's that, guys? That's excellent. Thank you. Okay, very power. Yeah, so let's start off quickly with, as you said, that, that very quick intro on what float is before we dive into the, the, the cool stuff in the Solidity editor you can see right here. So Float allows users to mint synthetic assets and do this without a lot of friction and without having a, a CDP, without having to over collateralize, worry about liquidations, a lot of the traditional things you find in, in synthetic asset protocols. So essentially, we let users get ERC20 tokenized exposure. This could be leveraged exposure to arbitrary asset classes and this is all you know happening with a lot of cool stuff ha happening under the hood which we'll show you but what the user will see if you head to float.capital online when they mint a synth is an extremely silky smooth experience to mint that synth and that's that's sort of what we do and yeah i won't dive into the weeds quite yet of, of how we do that we'll get into that now now amazing and just because I'm really curious, uh, do you have a background on on the team quickly or the project and how it came about? Sure. So we are um, we started out as a very tight team. We had been working together. So it's myself, John, John, and Denim. And Denim's not on this call at the moment. And uh, we have um, spent a lot of time working together. We uh, did projects together in university. Um, we started another company together previously called Wild Cards. We spent um, over a year doing consulting work together. So we, we are a very tight team and we are always very interested in DeFi and we spent a lot of our time thinking about new mechanisms. And um, Float actually was just one of many mechanisms that we uh, thought of and came up with, but obviously our time is limited and we decided to jump full time on float um, about seven months ago. And um, it's gone great since then. Um, I think uh, you can see that our code is live, we've got our alpha live, we've got close to two million dollars locked, um, and that's before some of our really cool tokenomics um, stuff has launched so it's it's gone really really well and um, and uh now the team is a little bit bigger and we we're growing um but at its core the the basic mechanism uh was a idea that we had together and uh we just went for so i guess that's encouragement for other inspiring solidity devs to actually just go for it um sometimes the smallest idea can grow into the biggest project Yeah, I, I fully agree on that last part. Um, we were just talking yesterday on our Linum Labs Lean Coffee, um, how, how would a Solidity dev really get started in 2021? And uh, my point uh, that I brought up was really do, do the little tutorials to Crypto Zombies in the beginning, maybe dabble around on build space, but then just get your hands dirty for the protocols you're interested in and start building things, making changes, creating. I find that's the best way to learn, and it's it's inspiring to hear that you guys really just dived in, and and this is how far you've come. You've pulled it off. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there isn't better advice. Um, this is such a new and evolving space. Um, if you are doing tutorials, that's great, and I really encourage you to do that. But you ultimately have to choose your own path, and. Um, you learn the most when you actually engage in what you're doing, and um, sometimes it's hard to find engagement when you're just doing tutorials. And I, so, I guess on that note, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, let me cut you off there. Well, we, we, uh, uh, I, I see that the path that you took is kind of finance-related instruments. Do you have backgrounds in finance? Um, I would say John John has the most background in finance. I've been. Uh, I, before I started the project working in um, the blockchain and Ethereum industry for, um, I guess, like four and a half years um, now. So um, through that, I've had a lot of exposure to finance and mechanism design and economics, etc. 
Uh, but my primary background is as a software engineer. And then just for the people who maybe aren't too familiar with the financial terms, uh, can you give us a quick explanation of what synths are or synthetic assets and then yeah, what sure. leverage is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about a regular asset, like let's just say gold, for example, if you have gold, you know, you have a gold bar in your house on your, your kitchen table, that's an asset. And, you know, if the price of gold goes up, you know, the price of your, your asset goes up, you know, you can sell it for more money and, and that's great. And people hold assets often because they can get good returns and, and they store their wealth nicely. Now, what synthetic assets allow you to do is you can get sort of the, the risk return profile or the, the price appreciation of that asset, gold or whatever it may be, without actually holding the real gold bar or having the real asset. So these synthetic assets mimic the price of the underlying asset. So if you have synthetic gold and the price of gold goes up, then the price of your synthetic gold should go up. So there's actually no gold behind it. It's just synthetic, but it acts and behaves as if it was following the price of gold. It's um, maybe to bring it to something more familiar, it's a type of derivative. So that's a term I'm sure people are potentially more familiar with. And um, derivatives are financial instruments where you're trading essentially on the price of assets, but you're not trading with the asset itself. So you're trading on the future price of it or um, the movement of the price or things like that. So all, all of that, um, it's a, you know, it's a big, um, it's a big group of uh, mechanisms, but derivatives are essentially trading on the, on the price of something. So for our system, we have a price feed, so we've got the price of the asset coming into our code, and our code does all of the rest of the, the mechanism. Why would someone want, like, you know, if you've got gold and you've got a synthetic of gold, uh, why or a gold synthetic, what, why would you trade the synthetic as opposed to just getting the real thing, so to speak? Um, I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if you've tried to buy a real bar of gold, but <laughs> it's, not, it's not so easy. <laughs> you've got to go places, it's not very 21st century, you have holding costs, um, selling it's not as liquid. If you're doing it with the synthetic ERC20 token, it's a lot more liquid and easy to get that exposure and manage that exposure as opposed to, you know, custodying the real assets. So a lot of it's just about efficiency and accessibility. Um, so I'd say those are the main reasons you would yeah, use a synthetic. Um, Regulatory right? access also, I take it? Uh, sorry, I missed that. Do we have access? No, regulatory access. Like, let's say you're talking about exactly. other financial assets that, yeah. Sure. So we building an open finance protocol, a DeFi protocol, which, as you say, means that access is open. I mean, it's as open as the Internet is. So anyone who has um, any sort of assets on, on the blockchains where we launched can easily get exposure to, to a wide variety of, of assets. And I think that's another thing that's interesting and worth pointing out, uh, synthetic assets can be constructed um, to, to be of assets that don't even exist in real life. And um, one example of that is the first market we launched, which is called the flippening. And that market is a way to buy the, the flippening, which is the ratio of the Ethereum market cap over the Bitcoin market cap. And there is no physical asset that you can buy or, um, yeah, that doesn't actually exist. So it has to be a derivative. Um, the other example for our platform is that you can get um, short exposure. So you can buy um, the short of an asset. And that means if the price of that asset goes down, you actually make money holding that asset. And um, so both of those things are um, 
quite uniquely enabled by synthetic assets. Awesome. Thank you for that explanation, John. John. It's really helpful. Um, I was digging into your YouTube videos uh, the other day around Float Protocol. Um, and I found it interesting that the reason why you call it Float Protocol is because you have this floating exposure to either side, right? So you have not necessarily 100% long or 100% short. That, that percentage changes. Do you want to go into a bit more depth on that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're starting to get into the, the real interesting parts over here. And if I look at mint, next price, there's basically two things you can do when you mint a position. You can mint a long position or you can mint a short position. So there's, I'm, I'm not sure, are you guys familiar with yearn pools and how those work, like yield optimization pools? Um, oh, oh yeah, dude. Absolutely. We're, Will and I are big fans of yearn. Degens, yeah. So I mean, how a yearn pool works, for those who don't know, is there's a whole bunch of collateral and if you want to add more money to this yearn vault depending on what the price per token is you add more money to the vault and you get minted shares of that vault essentially right um that's what's happening and we have almost a similar mechanism where we have a long vault and a short vault and if you mint a long or you mint a short position you add in capital to either the long side well, the short side and depending on what the price per token is at that point you'll be getting long tokens or, or short tokens right and because users can arbitrarily at any point in time add capital to either the the long side of the the pool or the short side of the pool the value in those two pools is always equal right if they were exactly equal then when one loses the other gains and you sort of have this perfect um, trade-off where value transfers between the long and the short pool where where one side wins and one side loses and just another step back if you are long on something basically you're betting the price is going up if you are short on something basically you're betting the price is going down so what happens is every couple minutes when we see receive an Oracle price update, as the price updates, we see, okay, if the price has gone up, let's take some of the collateral from this short pool and let's take it over to the long pool. Now the short ERC20 tokens can all be redeemed for slightly less collateral and hence the price has gone down. And on the long side, all of those ERC20 tokens can be redeemed for slightly more collateral. So the price of the long tokens has gone up. And that's how we essentially simulate and change, you know, the, have these synthetic tokens that track the price of these assets. Now, what your, your question was and what we're going back to is this, this balance of liquidity can often fluctuate. There might be more people long or more people short in a specific market. And that essentially affects the amount of value that flows between the two sides. So when we talk about exposure, if there's a biggish imbalance, and let's say there's a lot more short positions, there's a lot more short value in that short pool or the short vault than there is in the long vault, then the guys who are short, they, they don't have their full exposure because there's not enough people going long to actually take up their side of the bet. So what they have is what we call reduced exposure. What that, what that means, reduced exposures, let's just say the, the price were to go down 5% and you were short. Normally, you would then win 5% if the price went down. But if the exposure was only 50%, that means you would only win 2.5%. But you know, the converse is true. If the price were to go up 5% and you're holding this short position that only had 50% exposure, you would therefore only lose 2.5%. So it just means that the synth has a dampened movement and attracts slightly less than the underlying asset. But the thesis is the incentives we've built incentivize exposure around a certain fixed band. And, and that's going to be a more efficient mechanism, essentially, for, for creating synths. But let's, let's stop there and, and quickly go into your next question. Leverage, how does that work? 
Leverage basically just allows people to use less capital to get a bigger position on something. So if you have 3x leverage, what that means is if the price goes up 1%, you know, you may be winning 3%. Or if the price goes down 1%, you're losing 3%. So if you want a $300 position, you only need to put in $100 because all the price movements are essentially magnified by a 3x multiplier. So you can just take out a bigger position with less capital, which is useful in a, in a lot of situations, essentially. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and so I, I, was, I was wondering if I wanted to deploy uh, an, an ETH pool, let's say. So let's just keep it simple. Let's say exposure to ETH. Um, and then there would be the long side and the short side. Um, if I wanted to deploy that, but then also maybe I would want to go a bit further and make a leverage pool. So let's say a three X ETH pool. Would I be able to do something like that? Yeah. So, I mean, if you hit, if you head to float.capital, you see, we have a three X leveraged ETH pool that's live that you can use today. So that's something that we've done. And you know, the alpha is all about experimenting with lots of different types of, of assets, seeing how they perform, seeing if our incentives work as expected, you know, testing out sort of the system infrastructure. So yeah, that's where we at and cool that you mentioned that example. That's that's one of the first ones we got. Amazing. Um, and then to go a bit further on that one, how how custom can these pools get and are they are they kind of open for the community to to build on and deploy i know like i'm thinking a bit of an analogy uh to yearn here um mm. again and and they're they have a bit of a process around deploying bolts and strategies uh where it needs to sort of be audited and vetted and then it manages small pools of capital and then it finally gets sort of whitelisted to go into production and manage like large amounts of capital are you guys thinking around a process like that or is it open more than that or is it closed? Yeah, so for day one, the constraint of adding new synthetic assets is getting a reliable tamper-proof feed of the price of an asset because that's the basis of how value moves between the long and the short pools and if that could be manipulated, then value could be unfairly extracted. So right now, the, the constraint on just releasing new synthetics is getting a reliable oracle. So that's say an oracle price feed. And we've seen some assets like let's just take Climber, for example, you can't get a, a chain link oracle price feed for Climber yet because the trading volume's thin, it's only traded on one venue and there's a bunch of criteria that make it more susceptible to, to price manipulation that would lead us open to more attacks. So there's fundamentally um, some limitations on what synths can be released right now, but those limitations aren't just, you know, there for a silly reason. They're there to protect everyone, right? So those are the limitations for now, but of course we want to make it as open as possible and as new assets become available, you know, release what people want and, you know, move towards letting people release whatever is available as long as it yeah, conforms to, to safety standards. Sweet. Um, yeah, geez. that's a lot of uh, financial and economic insight to take in there. Um, I think if it's okay with you, we might just switch over to the solidity stuff here. And we'll, I think you have more insight and questions on that front. If I can find my unmute button, yeah. Um, yeah, so either I don't have a couple of questions, or if you want also, you can, I mean, it's a big repo. We're, we're not going to manage to make it through it in 40 minutes or even a couple hours. Uh, so if there are specific parts of the repo that you'd like to focus on or things that you guys want to talk about, so that that would also be fine for sure. Like I see you're opened up on long short. That seems to be like... I guess the main entry point in terms of getting the 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 contract suite over here. What would you guys? Think? I think we're going to spend ninety nine percent of our time on long short. Um, okay. But it, it would be my pleasure to go through some of the other contracts just so we know, you know, what's happening. I, I wouldn't even open them. Um, 
Alpha test float, that is an ERC20 token um, that we have for the Alpha launch. Um, just a standard ERC20 token that we issue as rewards. Um, Motor capital V0, this is our treasury contract. So this is where, um, sorry, no, this is the, <clears throat> yeah, it's a type of treasury. I can, I can see there's another treasury here. So this is the sort of uh, treasury for the DAO, whereas this is the treasury that um, buys back the float tokens. And um, that mechanism may change in the future. So we've got two treasury contracts. And then we've mm -hmm. got flow token, which is the same as this, just this is the, the token that won't be in alpha and isn't right. launched yet. Then we've got cool NFTs, which are actually already deployed. We haven't updated the UI, but these um, are NFTs that you can claim if you interact with the protocol enough. Oh, and they are linked to gems. So every time you interact with the protocol, um, within a 24-hour period, you earn 250 gems, and those gems are able to unlock privileges in our Discord server, so that's cool, but also not core to the mechanism. Uh, we've got a Keeper bot, which I won't go into. Then we've got our staking contract, which uh, is another sort of can of worms, and I don't think we'll go into that in this call. But essentially, you can stake your synthetic tokens to earn um, float rewards, and it acts as part of our incentive mechanism. Um, uh, let's skip all of this. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, and then we've got the yield manager, which is um, where all of the underlying capital or the payment tokens are deposited, and this obviously earns yield, which then can be used by our mechanism to incentivize certain behavior um, within the system. And then we've got our oracles and yeah, a whole bunch of test contracts, etc. So um, as I said before, I think let's start in long short and we'll mm -hmm. very likely stay here and maybe gear off into maybe the yield manager or staker just, just momentarily. Um, Maybe a good place to start is actually near the top, so you can sort of get an idea of the yeah. data structure and where what data is stored by long short. What do you think? Um, That's great. Yeah, I usually go top down. Oh, but uh, sorry, I didn't think about that. Sure. So so let's get going. Um, all of this is just constants and things that don't really change. Over the, over the course of the, the contract. And then we've got- I'm guessing this didn't fit in 24 KB without the optimizer, is that correct? Uh, sorry, I missed that? I'm guessing this did not fit in 24 kilobytes without the without the optimizer. Uh, I actually don't remember, but I mean, yes, we are we do have the optimizer enabled, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, may, maybe it wouldn't, it wouldn't deploy, or it wouldn't, wouldn't fit. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's quite a big contract. So, um, yes. Yeah. Hope you guys are ready. Have you got your seatbelts mm -hmm. on? We'll so, starting off a bit higher up, even I see that sure. you're saving an address as a constant, permanent initial liquidity holder. So, <laughs> this address, uh, if you see, this is spelled F L O A T. <laughs> Floatingly, yeah. And um, this, we could have used the zero address. We could have used any random address. We just this it's any address that doesn't have a private key and essentially the way the protocol works is we have to always um, have liquidity on both sides of the market if there's ever a time when there's zero people going long or zero people going short um, the code can run into really big and nasty problems like divide by zero issues for those mass uh, people out there divide by zero is really bad um, and undefined. So what we do is when we launch a market, we put a really small amount of liquidity in both sides of the market, and we lock that liquidity away to be owned by this permanent initial liquidity holder. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. no one has the private key for 
float, 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 float. Um, mm -hmm. that, that liquidity will be there forever. Obviously, it will grow and shrink slightly, um, but it will be percentage-wise, and uh, therefore the markets will always run, and there will always be something to trade against. So that's, this is for safety. And, Interesting. Um, I don't know what level you want to like uh, go in, um, but essentially a constant keyword means that um, this variable is baked into the contract. It doesn't even go into storage. It's actually in the contract logic itself, um, which means loading and reading this variable in our code is much cheaper, cheaper. than reading um, variables like this that aren't constant. So this is a variable that gets put into the Ethereum storage. So it's actually stored in, in the blockchain and um, the gas costs involved with reading this value are much higher than the gas costs involved with reading this value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I actually had not used the underscore trick on addresses. Yeah, I, had, I hadn't thought to. I hadn't thought that. I had just also for anyone who's listening, what I mean by the underscore trick is you can see that addresses usually yeah. don't have underscores in them, but they've put an underscore in between all floats in the address. So for you and you can do that, like uh, uh, like either you, Jason, or John, John are showing right now in the code, which can be really useful if you're if you're put typing out a number like a million or something like that. You can use them kind of like commas to have one underscore underscore uh, zero zero oh, yeah whatever. Yeah, I think you get what I'm saying. Um, but apparently you can do that for addresses cool too. That's actually, that, that, that's really cool. Cool. Also, I think maybe in the year 2018. Uh, no, no, okay, so jump ahead to whatever you wanted to jump ahead to. Yeah, yeah, I'd say I think maybe the logical way to start um, that, that I think might be nice to quickly look at is what happens when a user comes in. I mean, this is a big code base. We're honestly not going to get through it all. There's so much going on. So when you when you mint a position, let's just look quickly what happens with the user. So you'll notice there's something called mint next price, and this is a salient point of the code. Front running is an issue you want to avoid, and front running is someone observing the price of something change in real life, and before that price change reflects on the blockchain, they're able to perform an action knowing that the price will increase or decrease, and therefore, you know, basically get a riskless profit. And that's something you obviously don't want to have, otherwise no one would ever use this system. Everyone would just get wrecked. So a mint next price essentially says you're going to get a position in your next price. So you can see when you mint the next price over here, a bunch of things happen. But basically value is first added. So you see we transfer the payment tokens to the yield manager and I think I'll cover this part. And then I'll let Jason cover the next part over here. And I think that'll be sort of a great start. But guys, please stop and ask questions if you, you want to see what's going on. So yeah, so we're talking about minting a new position and we're doing it at the next price. And we're taking in which market this could be. Is it um, our flippening market, 3x leveraged Ethereum, ohm, the amount, and if it's a long or short position. And I'll let Jason also handle the, the modifiers. But what we're first doing is we're taking DAI from users. So you can see we're transferring payment tokens to the yield manager. And this payment token from day one is DAI, but it could be any ERC-20. So it's pretty cool. The collateral in this market could be um, an LP token. It could be wrapped staked OM. It could be a wrapped Bitcoin. It could be wrapped Ethereum. It could be a stable coin. Um, it's pretty cool seeing what that could be, which is which is really cool. So. Yeah, what happens is we essentially send it to our yield manager contract, which I'm going to open up. And what's really nice is we got a really efficient um, contract, uh, I'd say, system, because as you transfer your die to us, we have this deposit payment token function. And essentially, the long and short of what it's doing is contacting the Aave lending pool and asking, what's the address for me to deposit in? And then it's depositing that payment token, which is die at this point in time, and the amount, and it's giving the certain referral code. And just a very quick question over here. Uh, not a question, but just a, what on earth is this code doing right over here? Why don't we just sort of put the die in and, and put the die out? So 
for those of you who don't know how something like Aave works, a lending and borrowing protocol, you can obviously lend DAI. So let's say there's a million DAI being lent out, but people can also then borrow that DAI. So let's say um, $900,000 of DAI is being borrowed. That means there's only sort of $100,000 available, right? And if we had a big whale who deposited $10 million and that all went into Aave, and then all of that money got borrowed up, then if the user tried to essentially withdraw, we actually couldn't get all of that user's liquidity from Aave because it would be borrowed out. And this is a real nasty edge case we don't, we don't expect to um, run into just because of the size of, of the Aave market. But this code handles that very gracefully. You can see when you transfer the payment token to the user, we try transfer it, and if there's insufficient Aave liquidity, then what we do is we withdraw um, essentially certain amounts straight to the user. Otherwise, it reverts, and we can also actually just try send a die straight away. So a lot of a lot of that edge casing, it's actually a simple contract, but it's just us being prudent in handling that case. So first step to recap what a user is basically doing: they mint a position. Essentially, all they're doing and with minting this position is the first step is their die is getting piped straight through to Aave and it's, you know, being used to accrue interest, which is uh, nice and efficient. And yeah, Jason, maybe you want to go through the next part, so what's happening here. Sure. So you can actually see all we really are doing here is assigning values and modifying these, um, these global vari variables. Well, this, this is just a local variable for... Um, ease of reading and efficiency, but um, yeah, these three variables are um, very interesting. And I think let me quickly go back to the top so I can. Uh, there we go. Um, so we can see the market specific um, mappings. Uh, so I won't go through all of these, but you can see that there's um, a mapping of. A market index to synthetic tokens. So you can see um, in each market has an index. Um, so it starts from zero and goes up to you know as many markets as we have. And um, a boolean if it's long or sh long or short, and then the address. And then we also storing the value. So up here you can actually see the layout of what data this smart contract stores. Um, which is really useful when you're looking in the code to keep keep in mind. Um, but what you'll notice here is this over here, the batched amount of payment token to deposit. So how the system works is that um, when people enter the system, they get put into a batch and they can be zero to actually, I guess, infinite users in a batch, depending how many people interact uh, with the system between price movements. And when the price changes on the next price, all of those users get um, issued their tokens um, in this batch. So that's um, slightly complicated, but that's the core of how our system prevents something called front running. Um, and front running is essentially the mechanism by which um, users are able to um, see information that isn't available on the blockchain yet and get in just before, so they can exploit information mm -hmm. asymmetry. Um, I think John John said he might be keen to go through that in more detail, so I think we'll leave that. Um, and then obviously we need to keep track of the user accounting. So this is market accounting, so these three variables. Um, the one that we care about now is deposit, but there's actions for redeem and shifting. Shifting is going from long position to a short position or from a short position to a long position. And then you'll notice here we've got the exact same three variables, but per user. So here we've got the user's address, and um, this keeps track of the accounting. So these three variables and these three variables are the core of the accounting um, 
as users do action. So let's quickly go back. Um, because I assume that you need the batches there in order for the yield distribution, but then you are also going to need the user by user mappings in order so that users themselves can interact with their own personal balances. Yes, exactly. So um, it's efficient to operate on things as a batch, and it also make, means our code has no for loops at all. Not zero places in our code have for loops, and we um, strongly advise that um, all Solidity engineers really, really consider hard any time that they want to write a for loop, um, if they can redesign that, because um, for loops often can be unbounded or um, cause various issues. So in general, if you can write your code to not have for loops, that's, that's optimal. So the batch basically allows us to process many users all at once without the need for for loops. So you'll notice here that we add the amount to the batch, then we add the amount to the user. So this is um, batch accounting, this is user accounting, and then um, we record what index this user has come in at. So this um, update index keeps incrementing every time the price updates. Um, so on Chainlink, for example, on a feed, they might say that the price will update at least every five minutes. And that's actually all that happens when um, the user goes in and deposits. The complicated stuff, or much more complicated, is happening inside this um, modifier. So, I, I think that one actually does get the award for the single longest naming convention I have ever seen in Solidity. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. We, we, I mean, we were sharing this on our, on our Discord between each other. We're like, oh my god, these guys, <laughs> the modifiers <laughs> are so intense. We, uh, we've gone off the approach of readability in our code, and we, and we really want anyone to be able to come in and read a variable and know what it means without reading some stale comments or, or docs. And of course, we've got the comments and we've got the docs, um, but that's the, that's the motivation for these long, long names. And actually, you can, let's read it. It's the update system state, um, update system state market, and execute outstanding next, next price settlements. So, um, over here, this is a next price action, and this function executes all of those, all of those settlements, and it updates the whole system state. So that um, that basically checks um, how the price of the synthetic assets should move and how the liquidity in the long and short side should change. Um, I think. John John will probably take the next question, but is there anything more? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, yeah, you're right. That like the naming convention is so it's natural, and I think, well, I I think I'm gonna try start incorporating this in some of our code. I think like in contrast to something like MakerDAO where everything's named <laughs> cat, cat and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <not bad>. <laughs> I, those are the two extremes. Either you do it like MakerDAO, where you make the reader figure out everything on their own, or you literally, like, I would say this would be the, uh, the, the, the real, like, I don't even know if I'd seen this this far extreme in the other direction, or you, like, literally describe everything that it's going to do. I mean, MakerDAO, in their defense, what they're trying to do over there is they're basically just trying to say, like, we're not going to tell you what this does so that you actually read the code and figure it out. Uh, they have defended that a number of times. And there's a lot of people who like swear by it. But sometimes I kind of wonder if it's because they invested all of the time and uh, actually understanding it. So they feel like they kind of have to defend the sunk cost by saying it's awesome now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. I mean, I think that makes sense. We're definitely opposite spectrums and there's a bit of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a reason to do one or the other or maybe something in between. But yeah, I mean, I think it's been pretty cool, especially since we have a lot of Solidity engineers in our team and we have a lot of, you know, shared work on it. It just basically helps, uh, I would say, with refactoring and, and team knowledge refactoring for us to be as explicit as possible in what we're doing, which is cool. 
Um, but Jason was talking about this update system state position that happens first, and I'm just going to uh, just going to smash through to this main function, and this is really important, and this is what happens every time. Uh, uh, here we go. Yeah, yeah sorry. <clears throat> so basically, what's happening? What we said was we have almost like these two yearn pools, right? And if you, if you put liquidity in the long pool, you get minted these long tokens. If you put liquidity in the short pool, you get minted these short tokens. And what's happening is every system update, uh, uh, update system state represents a change in the Oracle price. So we're getting the new Oracle price and based on this new Oracle price, we're basically wanting to shift collateral from the, the long pool to the short pool or vice versa. So we're basically indexing these as almost like update indexes or epochs so we know exactly in the timeline where we are and we check if the asset price has changed we basically perform a bunch of actions and these actions essentially involve if we look down here eventually um, changing the price so you'll see we, we claim and distribute yield and rebalance the market so, so when the price has changed what we first doing is seeing how much yield if we look at from our yield manager have we actually earned over the past you know five minutes and who are we going to give this yield to depending on if the market is imbalanced are we going to give it to the long side or the short side where are we even going to allocate that yield how that's going to affect the price and then what we're also looking at is the value change so we're looking at the price that the asset has changed by and based on how much this asset price has changed by and based on the leverage, essentially what we're working out is the value change. And long story short, what we're doing is we're applying that value change over here and either the long side is winning or the short side is winning. And that basically means if you wanted to redeem your, your long ERC20 tokens or your short ERC20 tokens, they'll now have either more or less collateral backing them and therefore you know the price will have increased or, or decreased and this is all obviously dependent on uh, the change in the asset price so system state is, is is doing that for one very efficiently which is nice it's also doing some other stuff with the staker contract which we won't talk about but then the final thing just to build on what jason said is we, we're doing the batch confirmation. So remember, everyone between these two state points who wants to mint at the next price or redeem at the next price to avoid front running, um, it's only happening on this next Oracle price update. And to avoid having any nasty loops, this is all happening in one single batch where we're having uh, tokens essentially minted and held in escrow in this contract until they later um, sucked through a really tasty little hook into users just in time uh, balance. So that's essentially what's happening with the, with the batch confirmation of it. Maybe that's a good place to stop for now. Interesting. And then um, you did um, mention. Go ahead, Ben. Oh, so no, well, I think you, you go for it and then you, I'll, I'll wrap up with uh, just a question around the staking. Okay, cool. Um, so you were saying like, you know, in the last five minutes or something like that, how much price is updated. I mean, we all know blockchains are pretty good at automation. You can't have a smart contract that is self-aware that it needs to check something every five minutes. I, and I take it that's why you have a file in here that looks like it's experimenting with Keeper a little bit. But what is triggering this right now? Right now, this is just being triggered anytime somebody updates or creates a new position or withdraws a position. Like anytime there's somebody else, like a user is coming in and changing state. Is this like hit by like theoretically anybody or a platform? Do you have a bot that's hitting it? Like, what what are you doing to consistently update the price? Well, sure. So I'll talk a bit about this then. Then hand over to Jason, who's architected a lot of the bot. But yeah, we've got obviously hooks so that users hit and up, update this before they can interact. If users do interact with it and it hasn't been updated, but obviously you guys will be familiar with something like. Uh, Chainlink and their Keeper network and performing uh, consistent work on a contract and Chainlink Keepers wasn't available on, on Polygon when we started building this so we do also have a 
a really cool bot that's running almost our own keeper jason maybe you want to talk a bit about that architecture and the the monitoring redundancies and everything that goes on there yeah i, I won't go too off topic um i mean firstly it's it's maybe important mentioning that um, the system actually does work um without any any bot um it just degrades the user experience so Anyone on the, on the internet can execute this function. And whenever someone interacts with our contracts, this function does have to get executed um, because it's a, it's a hook or a modifier on, on all of the user-facing functions. Um, but that said, um, if there's a bot running to execute this um, more frequently and directly after some, someone interacts, then that user doesn't have to do the update themselves to see what the price is and it tracks the price more closely. Um, so without going into the details, um, what a keeper bot is, is a, a very simple um, contract that essentially returns whether a function should be called or not, like a simple boolean, and then you can have um, code off chain that just checks on that function and if it returns true it executes the operation um, that um, that it's supposed to um, so that's what the keeper network is uh, we aren't using the keeper network at the moment we're using our own custom custom bot um, but essentially it, it's um, it's the same same thing so we can decentralize that aspect of the system also cool um so um i'm not sure you guys wanted to jump to next but just because i'm also just uh keeping one eye on the clock where we've got about 10 minutes left um you've mentioned a few times that uh you solve front running it could be you've already gone through exactly how it hasn't 100 percent clicked for me yet i think you said but you said before that jason wanted to talk about that so i was wondering if maybe we could dive into that especially like from the mev angle like you know if you've got if you've got participants who are on a blockchain that does not make you pay millions of dollars to see the mempool, so we can assume that anybody's taking a look at it, or even if you are gating it for a million dollars, then all the people who have the million dollars to burn on arbitrage opportunities can see it and then lock everybody else into the dark forest. What are you doing that stops mm. mempool information from being relevant? So I think there's two different types of front running referring to here that we shouldn't get confused with. I think the front running you're referring to is observing a transaction in the mempool and let's say that's a user swapping between two particular assets and based on observing that in the mempool they can be yeah, mineable extractable value they can reorder transactions and put in their own swaps to extract value that's one type of front running and that front running is pertinent if you have a protocol where you're going to have um, users direct interaction in that time influencing price and there's different rates of slippage and price then that kind of front running is something you have to worry about so with our next price execution there's no slippage at any point like if you think someone's going to deposit into a yearn pool and put more dye in and get price at certain shares if you front run and also deposit into the yearn pool it's not like you're going to affect the guy right after you in the same block who's also depositing into the yearn pool. You're both minting, you know, shares in the yearn pool at the exact same price. And this guy's not causing you to get slippage or get a worse price at coming into um, the, the yearn pool. So that type of front running is not um, important with ob observing the, the mempool. The front running we're referring to is if we just say have a synthetic let's just say on gold and we're tracking the price of gold let's imagine you just see all of a sudden bbc news the price of gold or you're on bloomberg literally drops by 10 percent and you say oh i want to quickly short the price of gold on float before that new price reflection gets mined and updated on chain um, and basically that's prevented because you'll put in your short order but you'll only get the, the, the tokens, the short tokens will only be executed once we receive that next price update. And that next price update that's gonna come is gonna reflect that drop of price um, 
from uh, yeah. So I don't know. Does it, does that make a bit more sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so basically what you're talking about is you're talking about uh, more of like the overt price manipulation angle as opposed to like an EV generated angle. For sure, exactly. It's not like a, a type of AMM or something where there can be front running in MEV. Uh, it's just fundamentally the way the protocol works. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, what do you say, Dan? Um, yeah. You had a couple yeah, questions? Sorry. So I wanted to jump back a little bit to um, what the incentive models you guys have structured around this protocol, and particularly if you guys could touch on staking, because I think you have some interesting approaches to how to do staking here. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so this is actually part of the protocol that we are going to change, I think, the most when we move out of Alpha. Um, but I think the mechanism that we have is interesting. I'll I'll say that it is slightly um, more gas intensive um, than potentially we'd like. But we are in Polygon, and it's it's really not that bad. Um, but basically, over here we keep for every token we keep um, track of the cumulative rewards per synthetic token that is staked, um, which means we can do a, um, I guess, in a sense, it's kind of like an integral, if that makes sense. Um, but let's say you've got five tokens staked, you can take, um, you can take the amount um, that people were earning from now to five minutes ago. And you can calculate exactly how much they um, have earned, which means the rewards can be very dynamic and change on every single price update. Um, and users can claim their um, their rewards at any point in time, which is really cool. Um, it means that our staking system is very flexible. Um, there's no lock-in. You can enter and leave. Um, we do have fees for people leaving the staking pool, so that is a disincentive for people to just come in and exit um, too often. Um, but all the magic happens in this accumulative float per synthetic token. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if what I said makes enough sense. It's a little bit nazi. Um, but yeah, let, let me. The, the, the basic idea is just to add on to what Jason said, it's a technique called memoization and essentially what we want to do is we don't want to have to for every single user store how much you know float they've accrued because we've got you know we could have hundreds of thousands of users and that's inefficient. What we want to rather do is use a single aggregated checkpoint that's dynamic and can fluctuate and from that single point of storage we able to derive for any single user how much they've accumulated based on that specific user when they entered and when they exited and what their balances actually are. So it's re it's really just I would say the only way to efficiently um, yeah the the only way to efficiently calculate it uh, for a user if you have a a reward rate that's literally fluctuating in the order of every five minutes because how much a user earns is based on not only the dollar value of how much they've staked, which is changing every couple minutes, the time which they've staked, it's also based on the balance of liquidity between long and short in that pool. So it's just, yeah, say some, some math tricks to make sure that we can do it nicely in Solidity. Yeah, so once we have these values, for all the different um, update times, you can actually take the current accumulative minus the accumulative at the point where they last claimed or where they staked or you know um, when they started earning, and just multiply it by the amount that they staked. And any user can do this for any time points um, to determine how much that user should earn. Um, so what makes this gas intensive is that you, you're storing this history um, of, of all of these snapshots, which, yeah, as I say, isn't, isn't super cheap. 
Um, is this derived from the synthetic staking contract, or is this something you guys have uh, kind of coded up from scratch? And I, it has nothing to do with the synthetic token, uh, staking contract. It's yeah, completely, completely from, from scratch. scratch. Yeah. Okay, nice. That's that's very impressive because I know a lot of protocols often. Um, I think this is this synthetic staking contract is is sort of the base thing to fork for any staking system, and this is it's super impressive that you guys have coded the maths up from scratch here. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we wanted to really fine tune our, our incentives, so it made sense for us to have full control over it. Um, there's lots of variations and, and small tweaks that, that we can make um, if we have our own custom code. Yeah, I also think maybe just one of the last things to touch on, on my side, and we about to run over time, is um, I think we found in the past, if you try fork something and it's sort of similar but like doesn't quite fit, it ends up being you know a lot more complex and you often try to fit a circle into a square peg. And I think we found almost always like this entire code base, um, there's nothing that we forked at all. It's literally just everything's been from scratch. And I don't know, we've just found that as a much more solid way to, to engineer than to uh, Obviously, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, and there's good modular pieces of code. But if you fork something, then you actually don't understand how it works until you really dive into it. But if you write something yourself, you're forced to obviously understand very carefully how every single piece of it works and and why it is like that. You know, you have to justify why every piece works exactly as it does. Yeah, that, that's not to discourage you from spending a lot of time reading other people's code. Uh, get as much inspiration as you can. Uh, it just doesn't mean um, it's the best solution to start with someone else's code. Often it's better to start with your own and, and work out what problems your, um, your situation has that is unique to your code. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I it's it's like you clearly have to have a way deeper understanding when you're coding it from scratch, um, like you guys have done here. Uh, but I've also derived a lot of value and learning from just reading over some of the the contracts from like Sushi and Yearn and Synthetics and Compound, some of the OG DeFi things, um, and 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 trying to understand what was going through the heads of the guys coding that up at the time? What were they thinking? What were they trying to design for? Mm, of course, yeah. Cool, guys. I, I don't know if I think that we, I mean, we could, I think, as you were saying earlier, William, we could probably go on for another 10 hours, but <laughs> that, that would that would maybe be overboard. So that's, you know, really a light sprinkling and there are those videos that you guys mentioned if you want a more deep dive where we actually walk through some of the system parts in more detail if you guys are, are interested. And yeah, just a note, if anyone's seeing this and they want to build something cool on top of this, there's a lot of scope to actually build um, uh, vaults on the contract, to build stop loss um, vaults on the contract. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting things. So if you want to play around, you know, the cost of experimentation is extremely cheap on Polygon and yeah, that will be something cool to do. Yeah, so if you if you come to our Discord and say, hey, I'm a Solidity dev, I would love to build something related to this that uses this, um, I will personally give you, give you a hand, so that's potentially an opportunity for you guys. Um, we've got a lot of cool things that we can build and um, we don't have enough t time uh, or resources internally to build, so there's really a lot of scope. Um, so I'd encourage you to join our community and um, and get involved and continue to learn about our contracts and, and shoot questions if there's anything in our contracts and that still doesn't make sense after reading through it and, and digesting it. Okay, cool. So we're up against time, so uh, we're going to need to wrap here though. Uh, thanks a bunch for coming on. It's been awesome looking at your contracts. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on in there. And I'm probably supposed to say some kind of meaningful outro over here. So, you know, be careful where you are. 
and I guess that's about it for me. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's been awesome to be chatting and taking you all through this. We really